So uh, today we're going to encounter and compute in interesting ways yeah, our first uh, non-trivial amplitudes. And as I said, this is going to be uh, the first time we see a little bit of magic happen and not be slavishly responsible all the time. And as the course goes on, we'll later be just swimming in magic. But this is a reasonable amount of magic to uh, begin with. Um, so it's supposed to warm you up to the more relaxed attitude you have to take uh, if you're going to uh, enjoy this uh, subject. But first, let me say a couple of things uh, about the last lecture. First, uh, you know, one could probably give sort of four or five lectures, maybe not that many, but certainly two or three lectures, expanding out a little more slowly and doing a little more completely uh, what I did last time. Um, and uh, uh, some of the references, in particular the very first of the references that I gave you that was to the most recent paper, um, has some of this done reasonably pedagogically well. So what did we see last time? We saw that if we took the theory of massless particles and we just asked for the consistency of the four-point scattering amplitudes, assuming uh, something, the analog of weakly coupled tree-level scattering, that, that immediately forced on us the structure of grossly what we see uh, in the world around us. We could have interacting massless particles of, uh, of spin 0, 1 half, 1, 3 halves, and 2, um, and that's it. And uh, you can only have a single massless spin 2 particle, and that's gravity. And its couplings are forced to be universal, and we don't need falling elevators and Einstein and all the rest of that in order to uh, uh, be able to uh, see these things that the consistency of special relativity in quantum mechanics forces all of that structure on us. Uh, for massless spin one particles, there's a yang null structure. For massless spin three half, I sketch very quickly at the end, there's supersymmetry. Um, you, can, uh, you can go on. Uh, and this is the sort of thing which is done, again, not just for massless particles, but for massless particles in that first reference, to see many of the sort of famous results, again, that we attribute uh, to our ordinary understanding of local quantum field theory, all from the same algebraic check at four points. So things like the spin statistics theorem. Okay, so why, why uh, d let me just give you a rough idea of where spin statistics could possibly come out of this. Okay? So we're saying that if you have any massless particles, or massive particles for that matter, that their amplitudes have to have the correct statistics under interchange. Now where could that possibly come from? Well, it has to do with the consistency of coupling those particles to gravity. And if you remember, we saw this over and over again uh, uh, last time, that when you computed uh, the residue of the process in some channel, it had a pole in another channel. And that forced the existence of another channel, <laughs> right? Now, notice that, uh, so that means, let's say you have a uh, uh, graviton particle, graviton particle scattering. <laughs> then we saw that the pole in the S channel uh, forced us to have something in the U channel. <laughs> okay, but the U channel is exactly the exchange of the S channel. The particles are identical. So it can only work if the statistics are exactly correct. <laughs> And it's sort of forced on you. I didn't comment on it yes, uh, yesterday, but it forces on you either the bows or the Fermi statistics of the particles depending on their spin. There's nothing you can do about it. Okay? And that's a generic fact that things that we normally associate with the existence of locality or a, an energy momentum tensor or nice things about Lagrangians from the standard Lagrangian perspective are translated into various consistency conditions involving the presence of gravity uh, from the amplitude perspective. Uh, and that's reasonable because it's only when the theory is nice and local and normal that you can gauge, uh, uh, you can gauge gravity and, uh, and get consistent gravitational amplitude. So it's even reasonable that those things are related to each other. You can get more sophisticated things. For example, the Weinberg-Witten theorem, the Coleman-Mandula theorem. All of these things are a consequence of the four-particle check. Okay? And uh, so you can, uh, you can see all of that worked out in a little more uh, detail in the first one of those. Um, uh, in the first one of those references, uh, and, and the references uh, contained therein. Again, part of the reason I'm not dwelling on it is, uh, and I just sort of sketched how these things work, is just that there, once you get into this, uh, once you're working with the right variables and you're not giving these redundant descriptions, these are all things that follow quite easily. There's no magic, it's responsible, and so, uh, um, uh, so I, I encourage you, if you're interested, to look at it in more detail, because it's very, very nice and satisfying to see how all these classic facts emerge much more directly um, without going through this intermediary of, of introducing local quantum fields and talking about all this stuff, directly talking about the things you see, the on-shell particle states, uh, and the principles of relativity and quantum mechanics. Now, uh, <coughs> uh, just for, uh, but just so it's not entirely decoupled, 
before we get into the business of computing some interesting amplitudes for the first time, uh, I want to connect uh, a little bit uh, the way we are um, both uh, compare and contrast the way we are talking about um, the consistency conditions on the existence of massless particles last time to a more uh, to a more famous or an, at least an older traditional way of doing it that goes back to Steven Weinberg and the uh, and the famous soft theorems. Okay, so I want to just give you an idea of how it is that uh, Steve Weinberg first taught us in the 1960s to think about why general relativity has to be universally coupled, why, why photons have to be uh, coupled to conserved charges, and so on. And, um, and you will see here exactly what the sort of basic tension is. From the standard perspective, things like locality and the correctness of poles is hardwired in when you draw Feynman diagrams, or anything like Feynman diagrams. But the tricky business when you have massless particles with spin is those polarization vectors and the fact that they're not really Lorentz invariant and we can only talk about these equivalence classes of them. Okay? Uh, and so, uh, so, so the standard way is making something sort of opposite obvious and so you have to do a different kind of check to discover the same kind of, uh, the same kind of facts. But as you'll see, I'm going to conclude, we'll do it. It's, it's famous and it's very important and we're going to, as a nice byproduct, we're going to learn about these universal behavior of scattering amplitudes when photons and gravitons become soft, which is something very important that we'll be coming back to. Of course, something many of you here at Harvard understand uh, very, very well from many points of view. But, um, <coughs> but we'll also see, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll uh, compare and contrast what we learn from this point of view and from the standard point of view. Okay, so this is just a little aside. Uh, we'll come back to our central business in a moment. It's a little aside on the Weinberg soft theorem. and a more traditional way of understanding why there are restrictions on, uh, a massless, uh, uh, on the properties of massless particles with high spin, starting with spin equals 1. All right, so what is Weinberg asked? Weinberg says, let's say you have some scattering process. And um, uh, let's say to this uh, scattering process, you imagine there's one extra photon added. Okay, so we have a scattering of n plus 1 particles. Maybe there's some photons here, too. It doesn't matter. But there's an n plus first photon. But what we care about this photon is momentum is q. We care about looking at this amplitude in the limit. Let's look in the limit where q goes to 0, where the momentum q mu goes to 0. So this is the soft limit. And... Um, now let's just be a little bit naive and not worry about the infrared divergence. Let's even just imagine a tree level for a second. Imagine you were computing this in any kind of ersatz field theory. You don't know what the Feynman rules are very specifically. It doesn't matter. But let's just imagine um, what kind of diagrams uh, would be contributing to this. Well, there's sort of one obvious class, which is you take whatever you had before, and maybe there's a photon coming off the external leg. Okay, so these guys have the property that this momentum is p plus q, this momentum is p, this is q. So whatever the mass of this particle is, there's a 1 over p plus q squared minus, if this particle is mass m, minus m squared. Here, there's something in the numerator we'll come back to in a second. Okay, But certainly there's a 1 over p plus q squared that as q goes to 0, so what is this? This is some numerator divided by p squared minus m squared is equal to 0 q squared equals 0, so I just get something like 2p dot q. OK? So these terms have a singularity as q goes to 0. Okay, so these have a pole as q goes to 0. Now let's imagine other diagrams. So like, imagine some complicated tree diagram. Who knows what the heck is going on? It doesn't matter. But imagine that there's some kind of diagram like that. Those diagrams will not have any poles as q goes to 0. Right? And the reason is that in this, this precisely because nothing inside is on shell. So as you send its q to 0, the p squared wasn't close to 0 anyway. So it's, not going to be close, it's, it's still not going to be close to 0. OK, so that's one nice thing. In the soft limit, you get to forget about all these complicated diagrams where the photon is, uh, is uh, coupled to the internal legs. And you only care about the diagrams where it's coupled to the external ones. OK? Now, 
We don't even have to know about Lagrangians, Feynman rules, anything like that. Let's just ask, what is the biggest this amplitude can possibly be? How big can I possibly make it? Well, I have a numerator, right? So there's a polarization vector, epsilon mu, okay, associated with this photon. So how big can I possibly make this amplitude? Well, that polarization vector's got to dot into somebody. It can either dot into p mu for the i particle or into q mu. Well, epsilon dot q is equal to zero to begin with anyway. Okay, so the biggest I could possibly have this thing is for it to talk to p mu. Okay, and let's call that coupling constant ei. Okay, we happen to know that that's the charge, but let's just call it uh, ei. All right, so in other words, um, uh, associated with that vertex, for the numerator, we're going to have this factor epsilon dot pi, okay, um, for the numerator. And therefore, we learn that the amplitude for n plus 1 particles with the p's and a q added is equal to, we'll have to sum over all the i's of all the rest of this diagram in the limit as q goes to 0 is just the endpoint amplitude, right? So it's just the, the sum over i of uh, m of a, uh, p. But for each i, we have to write this factor, epsilon dot pi over, and from the propagator there, we have this 2 pi dot q. OK? Now let's actually keep going. Let's say that instead of having a photon, we had a particle of any spin, massless particle of any spin. We don't know yet, from this point of view, they're good, bad, whatever. OK, so let's say I have a massless particle of spin 2. So if I have a massless particle of spin 2, then it has some polarization vector epsilon mu nu. OK, massless particle of spin 3, it has three indices. But let's just do a spin spin 2 first. Then this m of n plus 1 would equal this sum over i. And now, once again, what's the biggest it could be is if I just keep contracting the epsilon symbol with the hard momentum, okay, with the big momentum p. So I could have something that looks like epsilon mu nu, pi nu, pi nu, over 2 pi dot q. Okay? So if I have a particle of spin 3, okay, in general, it will be the sum over i epsilon mu 1 through mu s for the spin, and then pi mu 1 through pi mu s over 2 pi dot q. OK. And this is all valid. These are the terms that dominate, again, in the soft limit as q goes to 0. OK. But now we have to input our physical condition. Remember, our physical condition is, let's say I go back to spin 1. I know that these polarization vectors are not invariant things, right? Th if I do a Lorentz transformation, I won't, come, uh, I won't come back to the same polarization vector or do a Lorentz transformation of the polarization vector. I'll go into it up to something proportional to its momentum. So that means that if I take epsilon mu and I shift it by epsilon mu plus anything times Q mu, the amplitude had better be invariant. So let's start doing this for uh, well, this let's start doing this for spin one. So this factor, this factor m n plus one, the one that contains the polarization vector. So this is m n times this sum over i. Uh, remember, we used to have epsilon uh, dot p i over 2 pi dot q, and then ei for the coupling constant. OK, so in order for this to be invariant under this shift, that means that if I replace epsilon with q, I'd better get 0. Right? So, so we learn that this thing had better equal 0. And very good. The q dot p cancels the q dot p downstairs, and I learn that whatever these charges are that have attached to the photon have to be conserved. Okay, the sum of all the i's has to equal 0. Okay, 
Okay, so that's how we learn that we have massless spin one particles that can couple to something, but they can only couple to some conserved charge. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's say we have a massless spin two particle, exactly the same thing. Now I have to take this guy, and now when I do this shift, right, uh, it had better be, so for a massless spin two particle, when I take epsilon mu nu, it will transform to epsilon mu nu plus some alpha mu p nu plus alpha nu p mu, or q. And therefore, invariance now tells us, since I can take alpha to be anything, invariance now tells us that I have to have that the sum of pi mu pi nu, when I take just one of these indices and I contract it into uh, Q nu. Oh, I'm sorry, there's some coupling constant here. Let me call it, in this case, kappa i. Some kappa i over p dot q, p i dot q, that this has to equal zero. So I just contracted one of them with q. That's because alpha could be arbitrary <laughs> in this uh, transformation. So from here I learned that also the charges have got to be conserved. But in this case, the charges that are conserved have an extra factor of momentum in them. It's ki pi nu, pi nu. OK, now that's a very funny formula, because we already know that momentum is conserved. We already know that p1 plus p2 plus pn equals 0. And if the k's are arbitrary, if these kappas are arbitrary, that means some other funny linear combination of momenta has got to be 0. And that would then make it impossible to have generic scattering processes, right? I couldn't have momenta come in and momenta go out with generic angles. OK, so that immediately, so naively we're dead. That means that we can't have any uh, possible consistent uh, uh, scattering process, except for, of course, one exception, if all the kappa i's are exactly equal to each other. OK, if this particle has exactly the same coupling to everything that could be participating in the scattering process, then this is just the same as momentum conservation. So from here we learn that massless spin 2 particles can be consistent. We can have spin equals 2, but this forces that all the kappa i are equal. This is universal coupling, the principle of equivalence. Again, no falling elevators, right? So we discover that massless spin 2 particles can have consistent universal couplings uh, to a matter. What about massless spin 3? See, now we're well and truly dead, because for massless spin 3, we'd have to have the sum of i, the analog would be kappa i, and now let's say pi nu, pi nu equals 0. So all we're doing all the time is just adding more and more indices. So this would be for massless spin 3. And now this is really impossible. This is some extra quadratic condition on the momenta, on top of momentum conservation. And that, that makes it impossible, at least in sufficiently high dimensions. In low enough dimensions, um, it, is, uh, it is possible. But then what we mean by, 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 by spin and so on is also, is also funny. So in, 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 in certainly in, in four dimensions and up, this is all true. Yes, Andy? Yeah, because here, uh, everything we're doing uh, here is in flat space. We're imagining flat space scattering amplitudes, and so uh, everything about Vassiliev of gra gravity is in empty de Sitter space. And, uh, and indeed, all the interactions in Vassiliev of gravity shut off in the, in the, in the LADS goes to infinity loop. Yes? Um, no. And that's good, because we know that scalars have nothing. The scalars are crappy things, modulo the fact that they exist in nature for some fucking reason, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, which is uh, related to the profound difficulties of, of particle physics. So, so maybe yeah. last time, yeah. the reduced field was zero. Sorry? Last time, the assumption was not that the momentum is going to be zero. No, no, that's right. So let me compare and contrast what we've, so, so I just want to do this so you saw the classic way of doing these things. And also we've learned something cool, right? We've learned these universal soft theorems, right? Um, and by the way, of course, we, we can and will derive these things from the other point of view that we're talking about. Okay? I just wanted you to, uh, to, uh, to see this sort of old classic way of uh, thinking about things. But now again, let's, let's uh, compare and, and, and contrast. Um, 
First, just as, as far as sort of power goes, this just tells us something about the consistent theories, but it doesn't ac actually help us compute the amplitudes. It just tells us something about a particular limit. Um, and it has sort of built into it a little bit of the artificiality of the field formalism, even though you want to say it has nothing to do with fields. The second the word polarization vector makes an appearance, you're doing something morally corrupt. Okay, those things do not exist. And so the second you're in this attitude, oh, they kind of exist, oh, then, then you're doing something halfway. <laughs> All right? But anyway, from this halfway point of view, it's perfectly fine. We learn something about the consistent theories, but we don't actually determine the amplitude. So last time we determined the amplitude, and again, from exactly the same check, just keep doing the check on all the particles involved, we learned all the other things too. We learned about supersymmetry, we learned about all the rest of it as well. Yes, Andy. No, I've not done the sub subleading soft theorem, and we, we'll get to the subleading soft theorem and stuff uh, later. I just wanted to, uh, yeah. Those, those could determine the amplitude, well, they could determine the amplitude, but, uh, um, uh, they, 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 they could determine the amplitude in, uh, um, I'll, be spe I'll definitely be speaking about this later in the uh, course. What, 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 what I meant is that uh, it still has, let, let me say it another way. Um, uh, the sort of best case scenario for something like this is always going to be one of these redundant formulas where you see something involving polarization vectors that you can then check as gauge invariant. So here, here we saw that's a, or or is invariant under this uh, or in, from this point of view is uh, Lorentz invariant when 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 we do this shift on uh, on uh, epsilon. Um, That's right. Oh, that's right. No, that, right. But that right. But that's uh, but then that's a that's a different kind of check. So 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 now uh, I'm uh, so um, uh, we're we're talking about things that are slightly philosophically different. Okay. So um, one 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 question. So but uh, so let me let me say this uh, uh, let me say this a, a little more clearly. From this point of view, why are you going to the soft limit? Well, really, you're trying to impose this condition epsilon dot p. Uh, you're, you're trying to find some way of building amplitudes that uh, have this on-shell ward identity condition that if you replace the polarization vector by a Q, you get zero. In fact, you don't have to go to the soft limit. You could, um, you could, and this is a this is a it's a fun exercise to do. It's another kind of uh, halfway thing to do. You could just decide you're going to play games with things that look like Feynman diagrams and polarization vectors. So, for example, if you're doing you might now, you, you might uh, look at something like Compton scattering. And you would just write down ordinary propagators, scalars, fermions, doesn't matter, ordinary propagators, ordinary polarization vectors. Uh, you'd have this diagram, you'd have that diagram. And then you, uh, you've never heard of Lagrangians, gauge invariants, you don't care. You're just gluing these things together and playing games with propagators and vertices <laughs> and trying to build something which is going to, however, have to have the magical property that if you take for any massless particle with spin m mu of its momentum and everything else, and you dot it into p mu, you'll get zero. Okay, so now that's that's a big condition. That's hard to satisfy. Okay, so for example, if you did it in this case of uh, of photons and, and and scalars, here you'd find slightly miraculously if you add the the, the uh, two channels and if the charges of the scalars uh, add up to zero, you find that it works. Um, however, if you decided that uh, you wanted to have many of these guys and many of these guys, uh, then, and you just gave this uh, vertex again, like we did last time, a name PAIJ, you would discover that this check, uh, that this check fails and gives you something proportional again to the commutator of PA and PB in IJ. And then you just playing games, you say, ah, but I can, I can fix that if I have this vertex too. If I give this a name, FABC, FABC, TCIJ, and then everything could be fine again. In other words, you could just playing by with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, just uh, attempting to build amplitudes with Feynman-like diagrams, with vertices and polarization vectors, you could derive all the consistent theories we know and love from the on-shell ward identity condition. Okay? And and then you could maybe then go back and discover that it came from gauge invariant Lagrangians by the, with some gauge fixing and so on. 
that's up to you if you wanted to do that or not. If you didn't notice that, you wouldn't lose much, okay, at, this, uh, at least at this, at this level. What Weinberg is doing is, in a sense, instead of doing the most general check of this sort, he's finding a very special place where you can do this check and already learn a lot. See, already in the soft limit, you can learn a lot. And you learn that if this is going to be true, you have to have this interesting universal behavior, first of all. And charge has got to be conserved. Gravity has got to be universal, and so on and so forth. So that's the sort of beginning of a story to see that there is a lot of conditions that you didn't know about before. Now you can ask something else. You can say, uh, just as an invariant fact about the amplitudes, they have interesting soft limits. They, they do. This is a way of deriving them. We could also derive them, never talking about this, just directly from the kind of formalism we're talking about, and we will. Okay, we will, uh, uh, later in the course, we'll be doing exactly that. And indeed, as you know very well, you discover not just soft limits, but interesting subleading soft limits. And there's many, many other interesting properties that these invariant objects actually have. Um, then it's a very interesting question, which sets of these interesting properties suffice to determine the object? And uh, that's something we're learning more and more about from many points of view. But certainly appears to be the case, quite remarkably appears to be the case, that some combination of the leading and the subleading soft theorems and, uh, are, could well, uh, could well totally determine the amplitude with just a, little, a few extra assumptions about the singularity structure, for example. Okay. Um, but what, what I wanted to emphasize here was just uh, was a, a little bit different. It's the, it's the points of view of, of, uh, of uh, amplitudes with polarization vectors gauge redundantly described with polarization vectors, um, uh, which is really the kind of field perspective, uh, or the directly write down the objects that transform correctly under the little group. That's the particle perspective. And uh, uh, this kind of exercise is a sort of halfway, halfway analog of what we were doing last time. And also Weinberg is, uh, is, uh, is the limit of this exercise where you happen to learn a lot uh, as uh, one of the particle momenta go, go, go to zero. Okay? But the difference between this and last time is simply just to say it again, what the starting point is. Okay? So, so the starting point last time is particles. We put in the particles, all the symmetries are correct, the little group transformation, everything is correct. And then the non-triviality is the correct pole structure and factorization on the poles. Here, the pole structure is built in. Okay? And, 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 a, and a rough version of factorization is built in just because you're gluing things out of things that look like Feynman diagrams. But it's not obvious you're talking about something that actually makes Lorentz invariant sense because of this redundancy issue of not being able to correctly pick out the uh, polarization vector. Okay, so, um, okay. So that was the end of the aside. I just wanted to uh, mention uh, this uh, connection and also see our first hint of the soft, soft theorems. All right. That, 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 no, no, not at all. That, 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 no, that, that the last part is, is uh, irrelevant. Okay? The, at the moment, the last part is uh, irrelevant. The, uh, I, I was, uh, the, the, uh, uh, everything up to this point, uh, well, everything in what you're saying that's relevant is just kinematics. So, so there's a correct kinematical way of talking about amplitudes in four dimensions of the spinner helicity variables. That's what they're actually functions of. Okay? Not redundantly, they're actually functions of the spinner helicity variables. Then, uh, then, then you just have to begin to see what they look like. And three particles is very special, and the, and the, the kinematics is very special. Uh, that was a, if you like, it was a small intuitive aside to just give you a, a picture of the things that are going to come in a few weeks, uh, maybe even next week, where we start seeing uh, Grassmannians and K-planes and N-dimensions and so on. To just say it's not such a crazy thing. It's sitting there already in this lambda, lambda, tilde data. But I mentioned that way of thinking about things only also just to give a geometric intuition for what's so special about three-particle kinematics. Okay? That if the lambdas are parallel, if the lambdas are generic, the lambda tildes have to be parallel, and so on. If you didn't want to have that geometric picture, you could also derive it algebraically. It's not a, it's not a big deal either way. Okay? But the main difference uh, is, that, uh, uh, is that working with spinner helicity variables, you're actually seeing what the amplitudes actually are. Th the kinematics and transformation properties are completely Obvious, and then now, now you get now that you've taken care of kinematics and symmetries. 
Now it's just the physical principles. Locality, unitarity, you check and see if they work. Yes? Yeah. Yes. That's right. So that's that's that. That is the only, that's right. That's right. So that's uh, so there is there is there is still a little bit here which is not uh, uh, which is not entirely not entirely self self consistent um, and um, uh, well it's it's, it's self consistent. This is why I, I said you have to, the one the, the the one input you need to take officially from from field theory is that the objects we're talking about need to have poles that look like one over p squared and not one over p squared squared or crazier poles. Okay, so, so that. So, so, uh, so that that that's actually not as different as 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 you think, because uh, because it is a it's a uh, it is a statement that the amplitudes you're interested in have interesting singularities, and singularities in general. I mean, you don't need to know anything about physics to know there's poles, branch cuts, and so on. Okay, so so there's a filtration in what we mean. If I don't want to say the word Lagrangian and tree level, um, at, at the level of the actual answer. Uh, what it means uh, to be tree level is that there is some approximation where the answer only has poles. Okay? And then, there's then, then as we keep going, there, uh, in, instead of just poles, we, we have to have branch cuts and more and more complicated uh, branch cuts and more and more complicated behavior of the discontinuities across those uh, branch cuts. Okay? So, uh, so if you like, the, what we think of as the perturbative Lagrangian expansion <laughs> also has an uh, interpretation in terms of expansion in complexity of function that makes an appearance. <laughs> Okay, things with either polynomials or just contact terms. Then poles is like exchange. Then branch cuts of a specific type is one loop. And branch cut of a more interesting type is two loop and so on. Okay, and uh, uh, the reason I'm not giving you a first principles answer is that going back to the first lecture, we don't know the first principles answer yet. <laughs> okay, but what we do know is sort of just sneaking a peek at the answer from what we're, what we're allowed to have from Lagrangian field theory, we see that it looks like it's organized in this way. It has something to do with degree of complexity of the, of the, of the analytic structure allowed. Okay? So you, you go from having polynomial to poles to branch cuts and so on. Okay? So, so uh, our, our attitude in this, uh, but, but now, now you see it's not some content-free thing because the second you just take that one fact, I'm allowed to have one over p squared, Right? Then we do what we did last time. And in, in an hour lecture, we derive Yang Mill scattering, graviton scattering. You know, that, the, that, that, that two to two graviton scattering amplitude is like a thousand Feynman diagrams. It's a horrendous, awful mess if you sat down and actually tried to compute it. Sorry, I mean, a thousand terms. It's one, a, few, a few Feynman diagrams. Okay? It's a horrendous, awful mess. We just got it. Okay? So that, that, that shows it has content, sort of. A, but it's a little experimental also to try to figure out what that structure is supposed to be. And we know what it is at low loop order. We know what it is at the tree level. We even know what it is at one loop. But uh, it's, it's sort of the frontier of our understanding to figure out what it is at two loops and higher today. Andy, yes? Right. That's right. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, I agree. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. 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 Uh, well, again, we have no idea. We, we, the, 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 uh, the problem is before trying to. Um, uh, uh, before trying to say anything non perturbative, you could just as a, as, a, uh, <coughs> as a window onto your understanding, you could say, Do we know if someone handed me something? You see, all of last time is like is, is imagining someone handed you the answer and then checking if it's right or wrong, right? And so we know if, if you're going to give me a tree level answer, it better only have poles and ask T and U, and I'm supposed to check that it factorizes correctly on the poles. Great. You can just ask. Say someone handed you an answer. They claimed it was one loop. So what, all it is is some function, some die logarithm, something with a branch cut. Do we know how to check if it's right or wrong? At one loop, we happen to know how to check if it's right or wrong. And it's kind of, it's a little bit fancy. But we know how to check if it's right or wrong. Let's say I hand you an answer putatively at two loops. We don't know how to check if it's right or wrong. That's just, that's just, that's just the truth. That's the level at which. So uh, 
And it's not just a few simple things, oh, you check something is positive. It's, it's, something, uh, it's something deeper. It's, it's, really something, it's really something deeper, and we don't really understand it well yet. From this crossing symmetry, uh, actually, let me go backwards. I mean, uh, crossing symmetry is not even obvious in standard Lagrangian field theory. <laughs> The, the proofs of crossing symmetry are very opaque. It, it's not remotely an obvious fact about standard Lagrangian field theory. Okay, so, so now, you could go back and try to assume crossing, but that's fine. You can assume the crossing. That, that helps a little. It does not. It, uh, those kind of things you can, uh, you can easily check on putative functions, and they could still be wrong. Okay, so there are, there are more interesting things about the kind of singularities that, are allowed, uh, that you're allowed to uh, encounter, and uh, we don't know. Yeah, but but I think but uh, that that was the that was the sort of uh, uh, philosophy I was trying to uh, say in the first lecture. Although now that we've seen a few more examples, the the discussion gets a little less philosophical, so we can we can have it maybe uh, more more con con concretely. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think it is extremely unlikely that we're going to just study very hard what these consistency conditions are. And just we didn't know them yet. And the 60s people, if they just spent 30 more years, they'd find all of them. And then we'll go back and we'll, and we'll impose them. I think it's much more likely we're going to write down the right answer. Okay, we're going to find the theory or the structure or something. Maybe it'll live on the celestial sphere. Maybe it lives in twister space. Maybe it's something much more abstract. But whatever it is, it's going to be something that just says, this is what I am, actually. And then we will see. It spits things out. We say, ah, cool. In some approximation, those are the things that we used to call poles, uh, you know, things that we should see at tree level. That comes out. What we call causality and unitarity and locality, that actually comes out of this structure. And then if we see that it works at one loop and two loop or whatever it is, hopefully it's a non-perturbative thing, right? But then we'll probably have some confidence it's giving us the right answer in general, right? And then uh, I think that's much, much more likely. And that's why the whole subject is more adventurous and a little more crazy. <laughs> but it's much more likely than we'll slavishly complete the program that was laid down in the 60s, because I think that seems completely impossible to me. That seems totally un unlikely to me. So, so, that's, uh, so the whole thing, despite the fact, that's what I was saying in the first lecture, despite the fact we're still talking about the S matrix, the philosophy in the end is exactly the opposite as the 1960s. We don't want to impose causality and, and uh, ultimately causality, the analytic structure of the amplitudes uh, implied by causality, because we don't know, really know what they are. We're hoping to find some structures that are going to spit it out on the other end and see, see the usual rules of space-time and, and, and quantum mechanics come out of these structures rather than be put in by hand. Okay? Um, everything we've been doing so far, though, is really in the spirit of the 1960s S-matrix program. Right? So what we're going to see now is the first hint of magic beyond it. Right? So uh, when we talk about BCFW recursion relations, that's really the first hint of some, something magical beyond it. Yes. Yes. We don't know how to say if that's yes. or whatever. That's right. Um, if we even think that that question makes sense, I mean, if you write down a manifest of duality um, and a Feynman perturbation approach is it so is it critical for questions that we should be able to answer? Well, I mean, that, that, uh, whatever fancy, sh you know, uh, um, before, l before learning general relativity, you need to learn linear algebra. Okay? And uh, before doing any fancy schmancy non-perturbative thing, there's a corner where at weak coupling. And if you understand things, you better under understand things there. You, you want to do Riemannian geometry, you better understand about linear transformation. Okay, so, um, so, uh, um, uh, so, but to your question about uh, 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 about um, uh, dualities, yeah, I mean, uh, you you would expect that there are some. S matrix in string theory, and it should have to do spectacular things as you change the dilaton. You should map one S matrix to another S matrix uh, in some remarkable way. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, um, that one of the many motivations of this subject is that if in any approximation, be it the low energy approximation or even the strings propagating in space time approximation, you build in something that looks like the space time of the quantum mechanics in that space you're not going to see something manifestly duality invariant. The whole point here is that we're going to not be doing that, and that is going to give us a hope of seeing something duality invariant. And in fact, we're going to, starting next week or the week after, see extremely explicit examples of this. Not for all of the fancy U dualities of string theory, but for a little part of it, which is fermionic T duality, that in this context is going to turn into these, the very hidden Yangian invariants of n equals 4 super Yang mills. Okay, so that's a very, that's a small version 
of exactly this big question. You have this duality symmetry. There are two different spaces, two different questions, magically the same formulas. And if, you're, if you took the attitude that, oh, we can't expect to have anything that covers, uh, has a description of all of physics in one regime, we describe it one way, another regime, we describe it another way, you would just give up at that point. But in fact, there's a third description of the physics that doesn't live in any space time, and it makes these symmetries blindingly obvious. Okay? But it's precisely by focusing on the physical things and not the unphysical ones, the redundant ones, the, the virtual particles, the polarization vectors. All those things are words that indicate redundancy and a commitment to something which is actually not there in the answer. So we're removing those commitments and trying to do something more invariant. OK, now, OK, so. Um, so let's let's talk about our uh, uh, let's talk about our program now. So um, what we've done, what we saw at uh, four points, is a special case of the following sort of program that you could try to pursue at tree level. Okay. So let me just say in the most general form possible. Let's say there's some amplitude. I'll just re represent by this blob here, and I have some particle species. Let me call them A. So capital A will just be an index for the for the, for the particle species. And, some, and they have helicities H. So A1, H1, A2, H2, up to AN, HN. OK, so I have some amplitude. And all I'm trying to do, all I'm trying to do is produce a function of all of the spinner helicity variables that go along with these, with these guys, all those brackets, which has the property that if the sum of any subset of the momenta, so in any subset, let me call it left, the sum over i, pi, squared goes to 0. There can be a pole only here. Okay? These are the only poles. Maybe there's no pole at all. Okay? But the only poles it can have is when uh, that, that goes to 0. And on the pole, and on the pole uh, we have to get that this, this amplitude goes like 1 over this uh, sum <coughs> of i in some index set left squared, okay, times the sum over particle species B and their helicities uh, of everything else the same, but an extra guy with B and H and B and minus H. OK? Is that clear? So if by hook or by crook, somehow you manage to give me a collection of functions. You have to give me a whole collection, right? Because this is a, this is a statement at higher points that refers to lower ones. So if you're going to give me amplitudes up to 10 for 10-point 10 scattering, you better also give me them to be 9, 8, 7, all the rest of them. OK? Remember, down to 3-point, we know the answer. It's fixed by symmetry. But OK? So, so that's all I'm trying to do, one way or another. Find some function that has this uh, property. Now, let me just, I'm going to, uh, uh, we're going to go through an example now um, of gluon scattering amplitudes. And here I'm going to use this color decomposition that I told you about last time. Okay? And um, uh, uh, this is, I'll put it up, I'll, you'll have a problem set on uh, Tuesday. I'll put it on your problem set to go through it in uh, detail, um, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's it's very, it's, very, uh, it's very intuitive, and it's also just, just going to make our life a little bit simpler. Um, so the amplitude now will have some color indices, A1 up to AN. So these are color indices. But we're going to write it as a sum over different traces. Okay, so we're going to sum over different orderings. So th there's some uh, different permutations, sigma, of trace PA1, P sigma. A1 up to sigma AN, and then an amplitude, something I'll call M of sigma 1 up to sigma N. So what that means con concretely is what we saw already last time. So if I'm talking about four-point gluon scattering, let's say, um, M A1, A2, A3, A4, I would write as trace PA1, PA2, PA3, PA4. Did this exactly backwards. A sigma 1 to A sigma n. 
And then what it multiplies, I would call m of 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? Plus, here I have just two different orderings, C, uh, three different orderings, ca3, ca2, ca4, m, 1, 3, 2, 4, plus trace, ca1, ca2, ca4, or sorry, ca3, ca4, ca2, m, 1, 3, 4, 2. Now, why do I only have three orderings there? Naively, how many orderings are there? 24, right? However, it's a trace. Okay, so, uh, so it's only up to overall cyclic shift. So that takes me from 24 um, down. Instead of being 4 factorial, it's 3 factorial. So it should naively be 6. However, these traces are also the same if you read everything forwards and backwards. Okay, so, that we, so the number of these orderings is not n factorial. It's not n minus 1 factorial. It's n minus 1 factorial over 2. So in general, we have n minus 1 factorial over two orderings. But the beauty of this is that then each one of these pieces now is the thing that we're going to talk about. And each one of these things are associated with diagrams. If you wanted to draw Feynman diagrams for these color-ordered amplitudes, you could. Um, uh, and all the diagrams would be planar. Okay, so you just draw 1, 2, 3, 4 around. Uh, around a circle, and all the diagrams would just be, uh, be, uh, be a planar. So uh, we saw an example of that. We saw an example of that last time. So for example, for gluon scattering, M1234, it could have singularities, poles in the S channel, like that, 1, 2, 3, 4, or in the T channel, like that, 1, 2, 3, 4, but not in the cross flow, right? 2, 4, 1, 3. OK? So, and in particular, in this case, it means that the only poles that we could have, you see, the only poles that we could have would involve a bunch of consecutive particles on one side in this sum, in the big sum that I erased, I'm sorry. Um, all the, the, since everything is just ordered, I can just have something that starts from i, and it goes up to some j minus 1, all consecutively. So i, i plus 1, i plus 2 up to j minus 1, and then j, j plus 1, dot, 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 up to i minus 1 on this side. Okay? All the indices are ordered around a circle. Okay, so the, the, the indices are naturally, cyc are naturally cyclically ordered. The amplitudes may not be cyclically ordered, of course, because the particles can have different helicities. Okay, so we're not saying that the amplitudes are equal if you clock all the indices over by one, but there's a natural cyclic structure on all these indices. OK, is that clear? OK, so, so having said all that, let's now, so I, I, I told you that if by hook or by crook, uh, somebody handed you some amplitudes, you could check if they're right or wrong. You could just check if they had poles in the correct spot and they factorized properly onto lower amplitudes. Okay? So let's, let's then look at our first amplitudes in this theory for general n, our first infinite classes of amplitudes. And our first infinite classes of amplitudes. So the first thing we're going to say is that the amplitude when all the gluon helicities are plus is 0. And when all of them are plus, but any one of them is minus, so just a single minus is also 0. OK? Now this one we're going to, you should complain about right away, because there is a counterexample to it. At three points, we said there are two amplitudes at three points. Minus, minus, plus, and plus, plus, minus. So what am I talking about? Well, in fact, this statement is that this amplitude is 0, except possibly for generic, except possibly for degenerate kinematics. As it happens at three particles, the only kinematics we have are degenerate kinematics. <laughs> OK? But, um, but, uh, uh, but otherwise, uh, so anyway, so, so uh, in practice, what this means is that unless the amplitudes are, uh, is that the only amplitude for generic kinematics, the only amplitude for which this is non-zero is the three-particle amplitude. So, so those are zero. And actually, let's quickly see why these are zero. OK, so let's quickly see why this correctly satisfies 
that, uh, uh, that they, they have factorized properly and so on. So let's start with the top one. Let's say it just had four points, plus, 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 plus. We could have done this last time, right? So why is plus, 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 plus zero? Well, what can it factorize onto? Okay. Zero has, has no poles, but we'd, it would be in bad shape because we know that the three particle amplitude, we're, we're putting in, sorry, what are we doing? We're, 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 we're putting in that the three particle amplitudes of the theory are minus, minus, plus, and plus, plus, minus. Okay. So these are the rules. We're, we're giving them both. This is, uh, we're saying that this is the base. So, so, so these are both g times 1, 2 cubed over 1, 3, 2, 3, and g times the other bracket. Okay, so this is, I'm beginning with this. So, um, so let's see why it is that the all plus uh, 0 is uh, consistent. Well, naively, I could have it. I just have to see whether it's possible for me to take all plus, 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 and some intermediate line here, and some intermediate plus, plus, some intermediate line. And let's see, could this possibly be non-zero? And it can't, because no matter what, one of these guys is going to have to have a plus on it. <laughs> Remember, I'm summing over opposite helicities on this line. OK? So one or other of these things would have to be zero. So this one is very zero, OK? But let's look at the other one. Let's look at this guy now. Okay, so let's look at one of them with a single minus. This one's slightly more interesting. <coughs> so let's say, for example, we do, uh, uh, we're looking for 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 minus, 4 plus. Well, I could have something here, naively. I could have 1 plus, 2 plus. <coughs> and so why can't I have here a minus on this side and a plus on this side? OK? That one's OK. OK? But let's see what it takes to get to this kinematics. Remember, I'm supposed to be on the pole. Uh, this can only happen on a pole when uh, in this case, P1 plus P2 squared is 0, right? So I'm sending P1, I'm sending P1 plus P2 squared to 0 in order to try to encounter uh, uh, something that looks like 1 over S times this guy. OK, and P1 plus P2 squared is 0. This means that uh, either the square bracket or the angle bracket of 1, 2 is 0. OK, so there's a two ways I could make that happen. I could have the angle bracket 0 or the square bracket 0. OK? So in other words, um, uh, in the lambda lambda tilde space, remember, in, in, in momentum space, you would say I have to just make one choice on the momenta uh, to make p1 plus p2 squared 0. So there's a co-dimension 1 slice in the space of all momenta that I have to head to in order to hit this factorization channel, right? And so. Here, for example, how could I do it? I could do it by moving the lambda and lambda tilde either to make one in lambda 1 and lambda 2 parallel or lambda tilde 1 and lambda 2 tilde 2 parallel. Now, let's look at this amplitude. This amplitude tells us that actually we have to have one of these choices, right? Because for this plus plus minus amplitude to be uh, non-vanishing, we had to have which configuration? This was the configuration where the lambdas were parallel. So this tells me, whatever the intermediate guy is, it tells me that I have to have lambda 1 parallel to lambda 2. That's fine. That's what I was forced to do, right, to go to this factorization channel, parallel to lambda i. <coughs> OK? Now let's go to this side. Well, this is also the same kind of amplitude, plus, plus, minus. Right? So for this one, I have to have that lambda i is parallel to lambda 3 is parallel to lambda 4. Right? But now this is a massive number of constraints on the lambdas. Right? I have to have lambda 1 parallel to lambda 2, lambda 2 parallel to lambda i, further parallel to lambda 3, further parallel to lambda 4. OK? So I have a chance for this residue to be non-vanishing, but not on a co-dimension 1 surface. OK? And so if the amplitudes, if the lambdas are generic, uh, this is not going to happen. So these amplitudes are, uh, can be non-zero. We'll even see them. We'll encounter them. Um, 
uh, there's some sense in which they're there, but, uh, but, um, uh, but you have to make the external data very, very degenerate in order to see them. Again, just like we did for three particle amplitudes, it's just there we didn't have any choice. It was a degeneration just forced on us by momentum conservation, but here it's much, much more degenerate even than we need. Yes? Uh, sure, yes, oh, there's lots of reasons we shouldn't uh, care about it, but, uh, but formally, it's, it's sometimes interesting to care about it. We'll, we'll see all of this a little bit later. At the moment, you're perfectly free to always never think about it, okay? They're, they're, they're zero. Okay, but see, this is kind of cool already. So we see that, uh, that uh, this is not obvious from Feynman diagrams. I, I, should, I should say ahead of time that uh, if you knew about uh, I mentioned in, in the first lecture, if you just try to calculate these things with Feynman diagrams, even two to three scattering, it's like you know 50 pages of algebra. And this is a big clue there's something wrong, because these 50 pages have no idea about the polarization vector. They, so they have no idea about the helicity dependence of the answer. And here, you just get some gigantic tensor, right? They have no idea that when all, that everything is plus, the answer is going to be 0, or everything is plus and 1 minus is going to be 0, right? That's you know, one of many indications that, that this, uh, this, this picture is missing something. But here we see very simply that, uh, that all these amplitudes uh, are zero. So let's see the first non-zero amplitudes. And these are the famous Park-Taylor amplitudes. Okay, so uh, Park and Taylor uh, told us 31, 32 years ago the following amazing formula. Um, that uh, the amplitude, when Everyone is plus, except two of them are minus now. So i and j, let's say, are minus. That this amplitude is given by the following remarkable formula. Just i j to the fourth over 1, 2, 2, 3 to n1. OK? And of course, conversely, the other way around, obviously, I should have said here too, I can switch around minus to plus everywhere, and I get the, exactly the same statements uh, switching lambda to lambda tilde. So I'm not going to bother uh, writing all those things down. And from here, we see that up to five points, every amplitude either is all plus, all minus, one minus, one plus, two minus, or two plus. So we've immediately figured out all the amplitudes up to five points. Okay. But now, why is this true? Now, first, let's look at this uh, for a small example. So let's look at this for uh, four-point scattering. So let's say I do uh, <coughs> 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus, oh, I guess what I did, yeah. 1 minus 2 plus, 3 minus 4 plus. So first of all, this amplitude is, uh, Park and Taylor tell us, is 1 3 fourth over 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1. By the way, I'm not going to write it down ever again, probably. Uh, the overall coupling constant dependent, but there's an overall coupling constant, which is uh, g to the n minus 2. OK? But I'm not going to keep writing it down. Now. Just a little exercise immediately. Let's compare this to the amplitude that we computed last time. Okay, last time uh, uh, we got something that sort of almost looks like this, but it looks like one three squared, two four squared, over s times p. Okay, so that's uh, what we wrote down last time. Let's just see why these two things are equal to each other. Just as a little exercise in playing with these brackets. Um, so uh, are they equal to each other? So let's just divide them. So 1, 3 to the fourth over 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1 over 1, 3 squared, 2, 4 squared. And remember, S was angle bracket 1, 2, square bracket 1, 2, and P was angle bracket 2, 3, square bracket 1, 3. OK, so this is equal to, there's a. 2, 4 squared upstairs. And there is a, a, a 1, 2, 1, 3 upstairs. 
Um, and downstairs, um, oh, sorry, what am I doing? There is a uh, 1, 3 squared, um, square bracket, 1, 2, square bracket, 2, 3, sorry, thank you. <coughs> Over and downstairs, I have uh, uh, 2, 4 squared. And then I have the angle brackets that we're missing here, which were 3, 4, and 4, 1. Okay? And let's just, uh, we, we can do this many ways. For example, again, remember last time we learned something like that when we have 2, 4, 4, 3, this thing in the middle is P4. So I can write this as P1 plus P2 plus P3. And the P3 plus P2 vanish. So that means that I can replace 4 with 1 here for the minus sign. But I'm not going to keep track of the minus sign. So this is equal to uh, 1, 2, uh, um, uh, 1, 3, 2, 3. 1, 3. Thank you. And similarly, I can do the other one. 2, 4, uh, <coughs> uh, 4, 1 is equal to, now I can, again, I can replace 4 now by 3. So this is 2, 3, uh, 1, 3. OK, and so everything cancels. Okay? So uh, the 1, 2, 2, 3 cancels the 1, 2, 2, 3. And the 1, 3 squared cancels the 1, 3 squared. Okay? So this is equal to 1. Okay, so it's the same, same formula. But this formula reveals the sort of remarkable holomorphy of the answer. The answer only depends on lambda, but not lambda tilde. Uh, quite remarkable. It's not generic at all. It's that's something very special to the sample case. But anyway, let's not go back to the form that we got it from. In fact, again, what we were doing last time was effectively imposing factorization to get this answer. Let's forget about what we did last time. We, we, we want to check if Park and Taylor are lying to us. So let's take this formula and see if it's true. Okay, so, well, what, what does this formula tell us? It, te it tells us that, uh, so let's, let's check. Let's check 1, 3 to the 4th over 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1. So for, in for instance, it tells us that there is a pole when s goes to 0, which is when 1, 2, 1, 2 goes to 0. OK? So good, there is a pole there. When that guy goes to 0, there is a pole. That's good. But now let's see if it does the correct thing on the pole. So we should find that as 1, 2 goes to 0, that this, this, this amplitude m should go like, well, there's this 1 over 1, 2, the 1 over s. But what's left should give me this factorization, 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4 plus with some intermediate guy. OK? And let's see who this felicity has got to be, because remember, how have I gone to this pole? I've gone to this pole by making lambda 1 parallel to lambda 2. OK, so that means since this has got to be the vertex where all the lambdas are parallel. And so that means that this guy has got to have felicity plus. And so this has to have felicity minus. OK? So far, so good? So, well, let's, let's, let's look at this. Let's look at this, and we want to compare this expression to this expression, in the limit is 1, 2 goes to 0. OK, and see if they're, if they're the same. And these are the sort of uh, manipulations that you have to get uh, used to doing a little bit. So let's, let's look at, um, let's, let's look at this, this formula. Uh, let, let's look at that factorization term, sorry. OK, so this plus. So this product is equal to, on this side, my formula was i2 cubed over 1, 2, 1i. And on this side, it's the other i3 cubed over i4 
3, 4. Right? So I just multiplied the, the, uh, the, the amplitudes on the left and the right. OK. Now, uh, now our problem is we need to figure out what are these i's, right? We have to figure out what are these i's. And we could do it in a slightly slicker way, but I just want to show you how you don't have to be slick at all. So let's just, we're, we're going to do things in the most boring possible way, most direct possible way. Okay, you should never be more clever than you need to be. And in these cases, we don't actually have to be clever at all. So, um, so what is i? Remember, this is the one where all the lambdas are parallel. So um, uh, I don't know the overall helicity, uh, the overall scaling of i. So um, nothing stops me from just saying that lambda i is equal to lambda 1. Of course, it's equal to some constant times lambda 1, right? They're parallel to each other. Uh, um, I'm not putting, let me put the indices here for once. Uh, so I could leave the constant there, um, but, uh, uh, but I can also just do a, a little group transformation to set that constant to 1. Okay, so I'm just doing that so, so I don't clutter things with an extra index. It wouldn't, it wouldn't matter at all. So let's say lambda i is equal to lambda 1. Um, and, and let's say that um, I've, made, uh, I've made lambda 2 proportional to lambda 1. All right, so let me just write. Lambda 2 equals some t times lambda 1. OK, so OK. Now, what do I know by momentum conservation at this vertex? I know that the sum of the lambda lambda tildes has got to add up to 0. right? So let's, so let's do that. So all the lambdas are proportional to each other. So, so let me just put an overall lambda 1 alpha out in front. Then I have lambda tilde 1 alpha dot plus uh, <coughs> t times lambda tilde 2 alpha dot plus lambda tilde i alpha dot equals 0. So that's what I learned from momentum conservation. Is that clear? Right? This is p1. I mean, this is just saying uh, this is the same as p1 alpha alpha dot plus p2 alpha alpha dot plus p intermediate alpha alpha dot equals 0. OK, and that's good. That tells me that how I can solve for lambda tilde, the intermediate lambda tilde, in terms of the 1 and 2. Right? The t was up to me. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to this configuration where 1 and 2 are parallel this particular way. You can't stop me. Okay? Uh, but now I've solved for lambda i and lambda tilde i. Okay, so lambda i, so summarizing, lambda i is lambda 1, and lambda tilde i is uh, negative, minus sign there, is lambda tilde 1 alpha dot plus t lambda tilde 2 alpha dot. So now we have everything we need to do this calculation. So first, let's, let's look at the first term, i2 cubed over 1, 2, 1 i. The only thing I'm going to be sloppy with here is signs. Okay? So what is i2? Well, let me take this formula. What happens if I uh, contract this lambda tilde i with lambda tilde 1? So in this formula, lambda tilde 1 contracted to itself is 0, so I'm going to get t times um, uh, lambda tilde 2. Let me see if I'm doing this the way I wanted to. Yeah, that's right. So, so, uh, so I1 is equal to T times 1, 2. And I2 is just equal to 1, 2. Okay, so if I shove this in here, from here I'm just going to get 1, 2 cubed over 1, 2, and then just the t times 1, 2 down here. So this whole thing is going to be 1 over t times a 1, 2 upstairs, and I, a 1, 2 upstairs. OK? What about this guy? This guy's easier because I don't have to do anything. i3 cubed over i4 t4 is equal to? Uh, just i was 1, right? So this is just 1, 3 cubed over uh, 4, 1, 3, 4. Again, I'm being sloppy with signs. Okay, cool. 
So the product times 1 over s. So we have 1 over 1, 2, 1, 2, the other bracket, times what? A 1, 2 that will dutifully kill that guy, and over t. And then we have 1, 3 cubed over 4, 1, 3, 4. OK? So this doesn't still quite look right. But remember that lambda 2 is t times lambda 1. So if I put a 1, 3 upstairs and a 1, 3 upstairs and, and downstairs, Okay, this is all this is all fine, and then t times one is two. So I got rid of the t in the end, and these one twos cancel. So this is indeed equal to one over one two. That cancels. T times one three is two three, three four, four one, and a one three to the fourth upstairs. That's correct. OK. And in fact, um, we can do the analog of that check uh, for all n. We can very quickly see recursively that the Park-Taylor amplitude is correct uh, for any n. So first of all, there's a, there is a kind of a remarkable prediction of this amplitude. right? It says that the only poles, uh, so let's look at Park-Taylor at all n. It says that the only poles are when i, i plus 1 goes to 0. Right? So that means that the only pole that we can, we can see, it says, are just with 2i and i plus 1 and this. What about all the rest of them? OK? Well, all the rest of them are obviously 0. So let's, let's imagine a very generic factorization channel. Imagine a very gen generic factorization channel with a large number of particles on the left and the right. And now just try to sprinkle two minuses anywhere on the outside. So let's say both minuses were on this side. Then you're dead, right? Because then all the rest of them either are plus, and whatever you put there is 0. Let's say you have one minus on this side, one minus on this side. Again, you're dead, right? So. Uh, your four, you, you must have that one of these two sides has a single minus in it, no matter what you do. And since we just said that the only situation for which we, the one minus is interesting is the one where, uh, uh, for the three-particle amplitude, any factorization must involve just a three-particle amplitude on one side. Okay? So that's very cool, and the Park-Taylor formula tells us that. It tells us there are no other poles. So that much checks out. And then we just have to check when we sit on the pole i i plus 1 goes to 0 that it factorizes properly. Okay, and we've effectively done that exercise okay, uh, at four points. Let me just do it at 5, and then you'll, uh, the argument at 5 you can now just trivially recurse this to all n. Um, but just let's do that, and then we'll, we'll stop. Uh, and tomorrow we'll, we'll begin with BCFW. Uh, sorry, uh, next time. We'll begin with the BCFW. But let's just see um, how it works in general. So, so let me just choose to call it 1 and 2. It doesn't matter. And let me just uh, assume that, that, that the i plus 1 factorization has both of them plus. You can, for yourselves, uh, do a few of the other combinations. But let's just see what this, uh, what, this, what this factorization channel looks like. So this one's especially easy. Because here again, I have i and i, so the minuses are sitting here already. Okay, so this has got to be minus. That's got to be plus. Um, so let's say I'm doing this literally for uh, five points for a second. So here I'm doing it for three minus four plus five minus ten. Okay. All right. So once again, I'm supposed to get, everything is the same as, as, as we had before. I'm supposed to get 1 over s, so there it is. On the left, I have just the same, i2 cubed over <coughs> um, uh, 
I1, 2, 1, 1, 2. And on the right now, I'm supposed to get uh, 3, 5 to the fourth over 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, I, I3. Okay. Right, that's a. That, sorry. No, no. I want one, one, one to be. Uh, I want one to be plus here. Sorry. No, no, because this is this is a plus plus minus amplitude. Uh, one two cubed. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, and um, <coughs> so once again, uh, let's say that I have made this happen by making um, uh, by making uh, uh, lambda two equals t lambda one, just everything exactly the same. So and lambda i is equal to lambda one. So again, just the formulas we had there already. So I'm just writing it again. So I1 equals T12, I2 equals 1, 2. OK, so, uh, so, so we get 1 over T12. The 1, 2 cubed over I1, I2, again, just becomes 1 over T. So one, two upstairs. And then I get T5 to the fourth over T4, four, four, five, five, two. Sorry, uh, I put I equals uh, one, right? Five, one, one, three. And so again, everything is fine. The one, two cancels. The only thing funny here is that th this is all good. One, two. 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 1. But 1, 3 looks funny, right? It's jumping over something. It should be 2, 3. That's exactly what the t was doing as before. Okay, so t goes into 1, 3 and turns us into 2, 3. And that argument works for all n. Okay? So you can, you can put any n things here. If the two minuses are on this side, and one plus two plus are on this side. Exactly the same argument tells you that you're correctly that you correctly factor it. Okay? And I'll leave it up to you to check some of the other combinations of poles. Um, but uh, these are our first examples, as I said, of something um, of uh, non-trivial amplitudes where you can get them from somewhere and check that they're uh, and check that they're right. In fact, this is what they actually did. So when Park and Taylor got this answer, um, after lots and lots of simplifications using all sorts of tricks from supersymmetry and other things like that to get the answer, I don't know, maybe Jake, you remember, uh, get the answer maybe down to 10 pages or 8 pages or something like that, um, they then wrote their next paper where they just wrote down this one line formula. And then they just checked. They just checked that it factorized. They had all the correct limits. And uh, um, so, uh, so that's broadly speaking our goal in the uh, in the adventurous part of this course is uh is to um is to just write down the answer or better yet in this case it's so simple you can actually write down the answer um, but you don't get too much insight into where it came from um, what you really want is some kind of structure question whatever that's going to spit out answers that you can then do something with to check if they have the properties of factorizing correctly except to do that from structures and ideas that don't look like anything. Uh, they have anything to do with uh, particles propagating in space time and wave functions involving in Hilbert space. OK, so um, we'll begin uh, next time. I thought we'd get to it today. But anyway, we'll begin next time with a proper introduction to uh, BCFW recursion relations and maximal supersymmetry. And we'll see why these things are closely related to each other. OK, thank you very much. <laughs>